All right, ladies and gentlemen, it's the Frankly Fabulous Video Diary for August 28th, 2021. The week that was, I just uh, finished watching, I've been watching a little bit of YouTube stuff recently. I just finished because I kind of stumbled upon this uh, YouTube personality, I guess you'd say, uh, Shoe on Head, which maybe people are familiar with, maybe people... It's, it's hard to say how much penetration the online kind of content marketplace has as far as, like, how famous these people actually are. Are they celebrities? Because they don't really appear in mainstream media, right? Like, even, even influencers or crossover success, like David Dobrik, you don't see him that much. At least, that, not, not that I'm aware of. Hollywood in the kind of entertainment industrial complex of all the CIA or FBI agent uh, fake celebrity, you know, Clooney, Jimmy Kimmel, Julia Roberts, the Oscars, that whole cabal of people, you know, that creates, I think, in the public's mind, this elite class or kind of exclusionary class of people that are mandating culture and sort of trying to control things from the top down. They're not a part of our flyover country, the weave of kind of, uh, you know, our mainstream culture or, you know, real, real life, right? The media used to be this thing that was like this incredibly prestigious there was a lot of gatekeeping, and it, it, there was there was a bottleneck really to get involved. Uh, you had to come to New York or L.A. Now it's not like that, right? There's all these YouTube video makers that have – I mean Shoe on Head has I think 1.6 million subscribers or something. And so I saw it on Twitter. I don't know. It was some Somebody retweeted something on Twitter. I don't remember exactly what it was, but Shoe on Head has like 400 some thousand Twitter followers, right? Which is almost as much as Tim Heidecker has, right? Tim Heidecker was on Adult Swim. He's somewhat like a real celebrity, a real kind of bona fide artist in the eyes of the publicity machine of distribution and, and, uh, Top down. I mean, Adult Swim. That's cable TV. Tim and Eric. The, the the sense of celebrity coming from television or movies or record industry. The two thousands. That was kind of the last decade of that. I feel like where it, that was the gold standard, and that was like the expectation, or like. Uh, whereas the two thousand tens, it became way more about that. W- that was kind of the first decade of of real, like, Instagram followers, influencers. I mean, you know, YouTubers became more of a thing, I would say. It has more bandwidth. I mean, this is this is one reason why we have this fucking cognitive dissonance with nobody trusting anything. The media tries to tell them, or the government, or... There's some perception that Obama, Joe Biden, the Democrats are part of the Hollywood, you know, Matt Damon, Alec Baldwin. It's like Team America bullshit. You know, it's a lot of South Park (laughs) thinking where it's like, oh, let's make fun of these celebrities because they're Democrats and they they try to be political and shit. It's like, hey, just shut the fuck up and, and just act or whatever. Um... That's le- I think people confuse Hollywood with like the New York Times and the media and it's all like one thing that's like working in cahoots. It's the Illuminati, the mass media, NBC Nightly News, Dan Rather, fucking, you know, Brian Williams, he's a liar. Didn't he lie about something in Iraq, Iraq? He kind of fabricated some details of some story, some helicopter went down or something. They undermine the credibility of the objective kind of mainstream media, whatever. 
But now, right, with the internet, obviously, there's there's an alternative, and you don't necessarily have to be an authority, per se, on anything to just have a YouTube show and... Uh, but I think it plays into people's idea of the meritocracy and you succeed, you live or die on YouTube based on the strength of your content, based on the strength of your ideas. But I, th I think a lot of these videos that get plays are just titillating, right? They're, they're good content. They're not necessarily true. They're some kind of like really like uh titillating right video about aliens or something or or some kind of alien conspiracy uh, you know we we discovered aliens at Roswell and the government has covered it up and now on YouTube you can go on and see you know these these kind of things that used to be kind of outlier conspiracy theory right like these people are kooks not that I don't believe in certain conspiracy theories or that certain things were not what we were told, but I think it all just get it gets mixed up now, right, in this sort of gumbo of the internet. And it's like, well, we don't trust the government, so we don't believe – we just won't believe anything. We're not believing this vaccine bullshit. I mean that's – I guess that's how I started get, getting on this was I, I was reading about what's going on in Louisiana. They're about to get hit with a hurricane, but – they have a 40% adult vaccination rate, and the, the coronavirus is just exploding there because people won't get it. So there's all these – I was reading a Reddit forum, Reddit nursing, of all these ICU nurses talking about – you know, it's just – it's literally hell. Like they – they every day they go to work like anti-vaxxers begging for the vaccine people are dying suffocating younger people right now it's like younger and younger people are going into the icus because they don't think they need the vaccine they're young it's not going to affect them and so the numbers are just like they're out, they're out of control but if you look at the freaking map it looks like a civil war map it's like Here's America, and the part that's red is all the fucking Confederacy states. It's Louisiana, Alabama, Florida, right? DeSantis, Texas. The guy is fucking – doesn't want any kind of mask mandates and shit. It's literally just the south. The south, it's like dark red. It's horrible. Their ICU beds are full. I, I heard something about – the next nearest ICU bed that was free was like in Connecticut or something. Maybe there's there's no, there's no way that can be true, but like some story about how they had to air med back, you know, somebody to Connecticut or something because they didn't have any. And so people who have other health problems, right? Like I have family members that live in Panama City Beach, Florida. They're, ha you know, one of them is kind of having some health issues, so she's in the hospital in and out, and it's like, well, the doctor's having to focus on these unvaccinated people, right? They won't get the vac vaccine because it's the mark of the beast. <laughs> like, I, it's just stubbornness. At this point, like, it, it, it literally is a cultural divide. That is a remnant of the fucking Civil War. That is a holdover where, like, literally these people... You can't tell me nothing, right? They don't want to believe any fucking thing. Like, whatever you say, just on pure principle, just on the fact that I'm the... I just am going to disagree with whatever the fuck it is. And, like, if it's masks, fuck you. We're not doing that. We're not making our kid wear masks. The CDC said that the masks don't do shit. We're not getting the vaccine. Fuck you. We don't want your experimental <laughs> medical. Meanwhile, they're taking fucking horse or what is it? Dewormer. This is what I don't get. Like, well, I mean, y you get it, but like it's it never tires of being frustrating because it's it's just pure stupidity. <coughs> It never tires of being frustrating, right? They won't get a vaccine because they believe 
everything is lying to them. The government, the CDC, whatever, the World Health Organization, they're all in cahoots. They're being controlled by aliens or something. That I, I don't get how they think if there's a war between good and evil, how they're on the right side of it. <laughs> like... Don't they see the pain and destruction their need like surely at this point they understand that if they don't get the vaccine they're at risk. They have to understand that. Like surely. <laughs> well, what I'm hearing, right? Cuz I I turn on the radio every time I'm making every day when I'm making breakfast and I've been I turn into WOR, right? Because that was the station that Joe Franklin was on, believe it or not. It was an a, it's an AM station. AM's kind of interesting or it used to be interesting. Now it's just right wing even in New York. It's these two guys buck and chip or something. You know, like they're fucking hunters or they're real down home hillbilly. They're not hillbillies, but they're macho, you know, they're super aggressive like debating everything and they just it's all like i'm saying they just disagree and they've been jumping on the afghanistan thing that's all they're fucking talking about uh, talking about we want to invoke the 25th amendment biden's unfit for office because look at what the fuck he did look what he did 13 troops died <laughs> like i think people are starting to see through this narrative like Look at how many people died in coronavirus yesterday in just one day. Over a thousand. And supposedly the pandemic's over. We're going back to normal. And nobody gives a shit. The, the same people who are up and, oh my god, 13 fucking troops died. They killed our fucking troops. We don't, we don't play that shit. This is America. We'll put a boot in your ass. Like, meanwhile, over a thousand people are dying every day. <laughs> It's like a 9-11 every two days. Ah, fuck them. We're not taking your vaccine. We got. We need our freedom. We don't want to. We don't want you know to be sheep. Meanwhile, we're taking sheep dewormer. <laughs> Literal fucking like drugs for livestock. We rather do that than take the vaccine. So one of the things, the ads, half this fucking show on WOR, I don't know how it went from Joe Franklin to extreme right-wing propaganda, but that's all it is all day. It's Hannity. Hannity comes on at 3, so I turn it on just to hear what the fuck they're talking about. And, of course, all they've been talking about Afghanistan. But the ad, right, <laughs> it's, it's hosted by Hannity. The ad, they play this ad during this Buck show, whoever the fuck these guys are. And it's Hannity talking about these fucking tablets that you can order that are, like, liquefied or, like, you know, juiced, like, blended, like, vegetable and fruit supplement. So it's like, get your 20 servings of daily vegetables in a, a pill form. A liquefied, you take these pills, and it's like eating 20 or 30. It helps your immune system is the point. The point of this ad, right? The, the, the belief of these people is I need to strengthen my immune system. This is how I'm going to beat – this is so crazy how blown out it is. This is how I'm going to beat coronavirus, not by getting a vaccine. I don't want the fucking experimental medical treatment. People on the right, right, people listening to Republican talk radio suddenly give a fuck about their health. Suddenly they're trying to like, oh, I'm going to get uh, – Fruits and vegetables in a pill form. It's going to take care of my immune system, so I'll kick coronavirus's ass. It's like, you can't just drink beer and eat Wendy's and do whatever the fuck you want and then take a little pill and your immune, oh, my immune system is going to handle it. It's like, that's not, there's a much, there's a proven answer here and it's not, like, I, I understand that people are trying to, to remain free and, and, and not be – not buy into the brainwashing. And the thing is that's exactly how they're buying into the brainwashing. The people that think they're not brainwashed and that they're like fighting the control are literally the ones being controlled. Like these decisions are completely counterintuitive. I don't think 
we're going to get to some point where suddenly there's going to be some big reveal and it's going to be like the aliens come or God or whatever. Everyone who got the vaccine is under our control now. You are slaves. It's like you're you're the ones fighting to go back to work. You're the ones <laughs> denying yourself something that could save your life. You're volunteering yourself to pain and suffering. Like you're the one that is 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 buying the alien slave labor fucking this well this is the other thing i think there's been so much resentment towards people on the government dole with the unemployment and with uh the eviction moratorium right the fucking supreme court just voted six to three (laughs) okay that's not close that's six republicans and three liberals so they just voted to strike down the eviction moratorium so the landlords can because this is this is what people in america believe all these landlords are getting fucked over how are they supposed to meet their obligations these are small you know they're not all big (laughs) it's unfair to them they don't there's no compassion in this fucking country you have you have half the people right who are liberals who live based on a sort of compassion principle even if it's like narcissistic <laughs> or yuppie lifestyle branding or something i think it's real i think like liberals want to do the right thing actually i think that's what motivates them maybe it doesn't always end up that way or it gets co-opted or this or that but i do believe this right Uh, you know i mean liberals they're smug whatever okay but they're not bad people like fucking john stewart the daily show is not an equivalent to hannity like hannity is bad (laughs) trump is bad like i don't want to talk about the democrats in specifically but like let's say hollywood people right i think they're trying they're 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 impact they're impasse right they're actors their job is to like i mean this is speaking as somebody who's an actor and went to fucking theater school and has been around actors they're narcissistic like yeah they want attention and they want to be like applauded for doing the right thing and they want to make a performance out of it and like but I think it comes from a good place. I think it comes from they feel insecure because of whatever, who hurt you, some shit that happened to them in their past. So they need attention. They need love, that motive. I don't know. Maybe this is an outdated toxic narrative, right? But I think they are more sympathetic to people who have been hurt. You know, An actor, you're supposed to understand why your character would behave no matter what. If they're a villain, if they're a bad guy. If they're bad lieutenant, if they're anti heroes, if you're Tony Soprano, right? He's got to humanize that character. He's got to make you, or at least that's that's what makes it compelling, right? And so I think that leads Hollywood smug elite. <laughs> and they're rich as fuck, and they're, you know, ooh, aren't we so great? I get the resentment too. It's it's really fucked up that our fucking entertainment industry and our culture comes from two fucking places in this country. That's just fucking stupid. But the people in flyover country don't do themselves any favors by just being dumb and they're they I think they're so insecure about being dumb and being able to be manipulated that they're like hyper vigilant against it. This is what I've noticed with people that I know that like – and the thing is like saying somebody's dumb is not really fair because everybody has different talents and values and different things they add. So like just because you test well or you have a high IQ or you're functional in that way does not make you a better person or anything than somebody who is like quote-unquote dumb who might be a truck driver or whatever, a farmer Like those people have talents and have special abilities that lie in different areas. So there doesn't need to be condescension either way. I think there's a gap there where the redneck 
truck driving working people think you know people on the left think they're smarter than them and so fuck you we're not going to work with you no matter what because you're patronizing to us you're condescending to us and we're human beings right and so how can we assimilate and value all of these things Right, so I think they're hyper vigilant about being brainwashed and manipulated because everybody tells them they're stupid and they're brainwashed. So rather than, but they're stupid. (laughs) So rather than like, oh, believe, kind of the the sensical thing that like the government needs people to believe just to like for their own well being. Like, hey, let's try and get vaccinated. Hey. Maybe we need a vaccine passport. Hey, uh, we need to wear masks and social distance. These aren't things that like it, it. I think it's easy to look at them as if they're some kind of conspiracy to separate us or drive us to the brink, put small businesses out of business. Is it some kind of uh, you know? worldwide conspiracy to like disrupt and install the chips and the singular like you're out of your fucking mind right the same thing these people that are against chips they care they do everything on facebook it's like the most redneck (laughs) right-wing people i know are all over facebook (laughs) because it's for stupid people (laughs) No, they're not stupid, right? They're not. Like, it's just, it's just, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're misappreciated. (laughs) They have different, different, and I mean, the Trump thing pushed things absolutely to the limit, where it was like, you could not compromise or reconcile. If somebody was a Trump supporter, it was like, no, this person is, (laughs) <laughs> and once again they didn't understand the severity of the situation they were just reacting and trying to differentiate themselves and they thought okay yeah this is a big fuck you to the government which i hate you know and it's not neoliberal conspiracy whatever lesser of two evils <laughs> it was definitely the greater of two evils i think people under well i don't know did they understand that? You, you've you got to be out of your mind if you think that Trump is the lesser of two evils. I mean, I think it forced people to be political in a way that has sort of lost a little bit of the urgency, right? Which is unfortunate. But that could come back real quick because the way things are going with the Democrats – you can see the public opinion already. I think what Biden's approval rating plummeted to forty-one percent because of the Afghanistan thing. I think everybody just went, "Whoa, what the fuck? Does this guy even know what he's doing?" Like it put it lent plausibility to the idea that like he's just out to lunch or something. Which I think they're starting to. It's starting to come back around. Like it was a big shock, but. I I agree to be honest with what James Carville said. <laughs> I hate to say that, but he's like, you know what? They lost the war 15 years ago. Like there was there's no good way to end this. I mean, it definitely right the the specifics of this situation are how did they let it just go out of control before they were able to like get their people to safety that's what is puzzling about it to me like i'm i mean i'm not like the biggest like (laughs) i'm not against the troops the troops are victims of circumstance i think a lot of the time or they're just we're like people there's there's people that are like that like they're we need to figure out a way to let them get that out of their system or whatever but like a lot of people that go into the army and shit are brainwashed. <laughs> this country is it's there's a huge 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 effort into into 
I mean, there's just a huge percentage of our population that is in the military, has been in the military. That's why they want to keep people poor and desperate because it's the only fucking choice you have. If you're born in a bad place, if you're a pillbilly, <laughs> or if you're from, you know, a war zone, anyway, it's like your only way out, either that or prison or whatever, right? That's a that's fucked up. That's got to change. They so the Republicans, they don't really want to help people's well-being. They don't want to increase people's stability or bottom line. They thrive on the chaos of competition. That's in their fucking philosophy, really. They don't really admit that, I wouldn't say, but <sighs> when you look at their politics, that's the only way I could like that I, that's like a nice way of framing what they do. Um So, but at the same time, it's like, how how did they not evacuate as many fucking people as possible before the shit hits the fan? That's where I see, like, a policy failure or something. That's where, I mean, granted, I'm, I'm willing to believe the idea that, like, okay, they trained these people, the Afghan army to defend themselves and they didn't they can't blame i mean that's they can't blame the the i mean did the did the u.s intelligence think that the tal the taliban could make it and it's it's another thing that if you actually look at whose fault this is it's bush and then trump right supposedly negotiated this whole fucking thing he was very cooperative with the Taliban, and people are – they're dumping it all on Biden, right? <laughs> Which uh, – it doesn't help what might happen at, at the midterms, certainly, and, and in the election in 2024. I mean I think even Kamala doesn't look that great. <laughs> Like there has been a little bit – I mean this is typical DNC bullshit. Like they're not good at at presentation or like making things seem like they're going smoothly or they're in command. The Republicans, that's all they're – all they're good at are like the theatrics of of how to set the frame – and how to make their pe like Bush was the picture of like calm, commanding, even though it was a total disaster, right? Those wars were created to make his friends rich. People act like it's a fucking joke or something. So pulling the plug on them. Who knows? Could they have done it better? <laughs> it's like Vietnam, right? So we've been down this fucking road before. There's just kind of an indication. I mean, all of these things adding up, right? The eviction moratorium ending. Unemployment runs out in like seven days or eight days or something. Meanwhile, there's as many people in the ICUs as there has been at any point during the pandemic. And yet, I mean, you want to talk about normalizing. Like, this is normalizing it. I mean, to, to be honest, and like, I, like, for my work and things, it's in person. <clears throat> and they expect people to come back, right? Because people are vaccinated. You have to show proof of vaccination. You have to get a negative test, this, that. 
to be honest, I don't think it's a good idea. Like, from what we've seen, I don't know what it is about California, but I've heard more about this in California. People that I know in L.A. or whatever have said things about breakthrough cases, right, amongst the vaccinated with the Pfizer, the Moderna, the good vaccines. And, um, you know, th- these were like smart people who, who were taking it very seriously, doing everything right, and they got breakthrough cases, a lot. I don't know if that was some – because like I said, I did hear about a, about an L.A. kind of an exceptional – so maybe there was something with one of the doses or something that they gave people. But these breakthrough cases are very possible, and you always, you always hear about it. It's like some group gathering in a room, and one person – because the Delta variant, right, is extremely contagious. I understand that – life goes on and there's this kind of hard ass we got to tough it to suck it up and just well i think a lot of people on the red side of things have been back at work and they've been kind of that's their mentality that's their that's a big part of america's like work you have to fucking work you have to work your ass off so to see people getting paid more than they get paid to not work <clears throat> i think the public opinion has has turned i think if they if they were to renew the unemployment benefits i think people would like resent it heavily <clears throat> i see things regularly restaurants looking for kitchen staff line cooks to be honest, I would argue that that probably has as much to do with immigration. Like, a lot of these positions that supposedly they can't fill, like, <clears throat> not to be, I mean, maybe I'm way off on this, but like, like for instance, I saw on Facebook a chef I had worked for in, in Columbus had a Facebook post about they're looking for two people to work in the kitchen. I think line cooks and <clears throat> this I the impression I got it's being part it's part of this narrative hey there's plenty of jobs these people need to get back to work the the point is not like whether or not people need it's like whether the question is whether or not it's safe to do so particularly with <clears throat> excuse me um the delta variant and all of these dumbasses who won't get vaccinated like i think it would be one thing to proceed as normal if everybody was getting vaccinated i mean in new york i did hear that for the second week in a row transmission rates have gone down so that's a good sign <clears throat> and to some degree I do think it indicates like we can proceed with caution maybe but at the same time like right I'm looking at this play that I was maybe going to want to go see at Hunter College <clears throat> and it's 75 seats and they're doing it August 28th to the end of September or something October <clears throat> and a part of me is like yeah, I should go to this, but a part of me is also like, you know, I don't really think this is safe, to be honest. And I think it's kind of irresponsible for them to be doing it. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I saw in California, Beyond Baroque, the literary organization in Venice, they had... They had... Uh, they pushed back their plans to do in-person events. They said, you know what, we were thinking about doing it for fall, but we decided it's just too early. And to be honest, I think that was the right call. I, I do think it's too early. Like, <clears throat> this could backfire. I mean, maybe in places where there's high rates of vaccination, like New York City, I'm not exactly sure what the percentage is here, but... 
maybe it's not as high as you'd expect. I mean, I heard among black uh, citizens, it's like 40%, or it's very low, especially among youth, right? So, like, <clears throat> it's it's putting certain people in a more dangerous position than others, like it has the whole time, right? By socioeconomic status, by X, Y, or Z. People who have to go to work, people who have to... <clears throat> and... Uh, I think the argument that, like, we don't have the money... Well, you don't really hear that argument, right? Because, like, the other, the other thing I hear a lot, right, is that it would only cost $20 billion to end homelessness in the United States. This is a, f a fact I hear somewhat regularly. $20 billion. With 20 – Jeff Bezos, why the fuck do you go to space? Elon Musk, why do you go to fucking – why are you going to Mars with, for $20 billion? That's nothing to them. That's a drop in the bucket. <clears throat> you could end homelessness, and yet you you don't really hear you know they don't they never talk about well the government for look at how much they spend on the military every fucking year seven hundred fifty billion dollars a year. Look at how much money we've already spent in Afghanistan. It was it was three hundred million dollars a day or something. I I saw that war cost three hundred million dollars a day. That is a that is theft. They are money. They're they're vacuuming money. They're siphoning money from poor people, from taxpayers, right? <clears throat> and they're giving it to their friends. That's what the right wing is doing. Once again, their constituents. Oh, we hate the fucking government. We hate big government. Meanwhile, I'm going to vote for Bush twice because he's a Republican. He's a conservative. I mean, what did he do? The debt exploded. The deficit exploded. Two wars, $300 million a day. How much did those fucking wars cost? Trillion dollars. Huge government. You want to talk about big government? Nobody's getting fucked over more than the people who voted for him. Those are the people who are going in the fucking army. Not blue state liberal <laughs> soy boys like me. It's rural people, it's religious people, it's people in low-income areas. It's not people going to college and shit. I mean, you had people going to college after they were in the military, or they'd be in reserve or whatever. I knew some people that were in reserve and shit. Or in my classes at Ohio State, I mean, there was always tons of military people that were on GI Bill and shit. That's why they went into the military, you know. So, $20 billion, they could end homelessness, but they don't want to end homelessness. Why? Because that would fuck up the market. That would fuck up the real estate values. It would fuck up their, their money. <laughs> they need the inequality. I don't I mean they want to make more people homeless because they want the property. Like for instance, this, right? New York. They want to be able to kick people out of their fucking houses. They want to kick people on rent control out. They need to be able to evict people so they can tear down these buildings and build new shit. It's just all rigged, right? That's the thing that you don't realize. Like you think, "Oh, the de the development money is going to the people with our best interests in mind. It's like no, they want to engineer things a certain way. It's really like like everything in our government or a lot of things in our government. They it's it's like become privatized through all these weird kind of like like prisons or like so like tax abatements, right? That's basically like okay, so. I've been watching a lot of this mafia stuff. <laughs> One guy in particular, this guy Michael Francisi, very interesting. And he's like a YouTuber now. He's all over fucking YouTube talking about how it really was because he was in the mafia kind of – or you know whatever. In the seven, he was in the – I think the Gambino or 
Paul Castellano. I don't know. One of those fucking crime families in the 70s and 80s. And he's he's great. I highly recommend <laughs> his videos. He's probably a sociopath, but that's why he's so good on YouTube. <laughs> but um, he was talking about the best scheme he ever had was – he met these Russians in Brighton Beach who were importing – they had gas stations, and they were importing gasoline. And he said the best scheme he ever had was he got in on all these gas stations where they bought all these gas stations. This was during the 70s, and I guess there was some kind of huge tax on gas or something. And so the tax on gasoline was like 40 cents a gallon or something, like 20 percent federal – 20 cents federal and like 15 cents state or something like that. And he said what they did was they just didn't pay the tax. They they lowered their gas a little bit so it was cheaper than the competition. But the people, you know, just bought gas from them and then so rather than paying the the tax, they just didn't fucking pay it, right? And he said they made they were making 10 million dollars a week in the 70s doing this, which like it sounds like a very simple thing. In fact, it sounds so like kind of primitively it's like brutal it's like oh we're just not paying that like this is every republican's wet dream oh we're not paying our fucking taxes i don't i don't know how they didn't get like how they were able to do that i think they probably were just not reporting it they were probably getting cash maybe so like there was no record of how much they were selling and this and that um but if you think about it, that's really not that different than when they give these tax abatements to developers or Amazon or Trump, right? He made his whole shit based on, well, he's going to build housing, but he gets tax breaks to do it. So, like, he's saving $300 million or he's saving, you know, every time they build a new arena, it's like they levy some kind of fucking tax. They give. They give breaks to the people that are going to create jobs, which of course doesn't really happen that much. And in fact, what was it? I, there's always stories like this in the news, but it was something like – I don't know if it was Amazon. Or it was some fucking company got some kind of huge tax abatement worth like billions of dollars to build some shit, and it was going to create like 20 jobs. It's like – the money you're giving them far outweighs any kind of like what you're going to make back. Like it's far disproportionate. Like they're the, – the, these companies that are getting the tax abatements are getting way more than they're giving. And they, this is how they get rich, right? I read some fucking low – or uh, what is it? Uh, affordable housing – some kind of affordable housing developer had some like super mansion in New York or had like some kind of super lavish. It's like this guy builds affordable housing. He shouldn't be rich. He shouldn't be living like some kind of baller ass lifestyle. Like there's just like the CEO superstar fucking expectation that like if you're in that class of people, you, you it doesn't matter what you do. Oh, I'm the CEO of Goodwill. I'm worth $200 million. You know, I get a hundred million. It's like what? <laughs> that's not. That's not what that biz- like. Affordable housing is not a for-profit fucking thing. But like everything, right? Prisons. It's like this is not. This was not created to be a fucking business. Like some people who were lobbyists rewrote the goddamn rules so the taxpayers would foot all of their financial liability, and so they would have no fucking skin in the game and then they they make more money by shaving quality <laughs> off of the very thing that they're being paid to do right you're being paid to build a prison to make it functional or whatever make it theoretically the best prison it can be based on free market principle or whatever the fuck that's not what they're going to be encouraged to do. Like, <clears throat> they're going to shave every fucking way they goddamn can. The food, the furniture, anything to increase their profit. So a few people get rich, right? 
and they pull the wool over our fucking heads by brainwashing these goddamn people in our gerrymandered uh, hellscape. The right wing chaw. <laughs> the gas station people. God love them. Our brothers and sisters. <laughs> Or human brothers and sisters. Fuck. I mean, I just got to say fuck the human beings. It's just like we've taken too much of the of the natural. I don't even want to say bounty because that implies that it's like some kind of like reward, which it isn't. It's like we're a part of it in the environment. We should cooperate with it. It should be an equal... Mutually beneficial. (laughs) Um, When you you start to look closer at the organized crime stuff, you start to realize how it functions in a similar way or how it's woven into our life. And it's cynical to say, but I mean particularly now, right? Just because there aren't a bunch of fucking Italian guys with accents in Little Italy fucking shooting each other and shit. Like people think organized crime is over. This romantic idea of mafia, right, that we've seen in movies and shit, that's over. But when you look at the money laundering that goes on with these super towers and... Who, where that money comes from? I mean, so this guy, right? Michael Francis had a fucking gas operation where he was stealing tax. He's a mafia guy, you know. In our heads, we're thinking, oh, he's he's whacking people and he's uh numbers doing numbers or whatever the fuck. But it's like what he's what he was involved with. Like he said, he got involved with some Russians in Brighton. That's not. That's the same fucking thing that Putin does, basically, and and a lot of these Russian oil fucking people that were that were mixed up with Trump, right? Who buy condos in Midtown Manhattan, two hundred million dollar apartments. They need places to launder their money. They need assets, right? Cash is like volatile. It's well, it can it, – it, it's liquid. It's not – you need assets. And when you're taking in a lot of cash, right, like like Michael Francis, they're taking in $10 million a week that they're not reporting to the government. The government – he calls it the government. We weren't paying the government. Um. You put that cash into an apartment. Oh, we paid cash. That's one thing he says. What's wrong with that? We bought it with cash. (laughs) This is what drug dealers do, right? They buy everything with cash. Cash is king. Real estate. Landlords love cash. But it's a – obviously, it's a way of of fucking alchemizing your cash (laughs) and purifying it. Uh You know, when these Russian oil people are the Bushes, right, going into Iraq or Afghanistan for their natural resource, for their oil, they're killing hundreds of thousands of people. And it's the same argument, right, that Michael Corleone makes in The Godfather. That now who's being naive? You think that senators and whatever, they don't kill people? Now who's being naive? This is this is one reason why I think mafia movies are so such a part of like the American imagination is because right there the the metaphor they've appended onto it is it's business, right? And business is America. The mafia is kind of like a poetic romanticized version of the ruthlessness of capitalism and what it requires you to do. If it requires you to kill somebody, right? That's just – it's business. It's not personal. This guy, he's a – he could turn state's evidence. We got to kill him or he's a witness. You know, He could put people – we don't 
you know, this is Michael Francis makes the point that like it was a serious thing. It wasn't the in the movies. It's displayed as like this kind of like it's part of the spectacle. It's part of the 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 ride of the fucking movie. But these for these mafia guys, it was a serious thing if they were gonna have somebody whacked, right? So they'd have a sit or they'd talk about it, or only the boss, right, can fucking decide <laughs> if somebody's gonna get whacked. And uh, the boss, right? That's a that's a work thing. The boss, the capos, the associates, the soldiers. This guy's a great earner. This is what Tony says about Vito or Ralphie. They're great earners. They make money. That's what they're there to fucking do. So like. Essentially, that is what it's about. I mean, the 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 black magic of the mafia is that they do it with, I mean, gambling, right? Racketeering. Because to be honest, I didn't, as a younger person watching mafia movies and things, I didn't really understand the economic you know the movies are so much about like getting whacked and just like the the respect and the the you know goodfellas right was you know they're like ripping off the lufthansa heist right like they're ripping off shit at the airport but it doesn't go that into what they really do like there's some shit about gambling and stuff but like the actual business of how the mafia takes things that are illegal and extrapolates huge sums of money to the point that they're like a big economy right these guys were fucking rich they had big houses they had big cars it was a flamboyant outlier but like tony soprano says they wanted a piece they weren't they were immigrants they 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 took <laughs> they had to create their own wealth and piece of the pie right so they invent shit like like loan sharking they loan you money at huge interest interest rate under penalty of we'll break your fucking legs gambling right lending people money to gamble more like robert patrick on the sopranos he's got a gambling fucking problem so what do they do they end up taking possession of his store and they do a bust out <laughs> like they do in goodfellas they take the guy's bar they use it to charge a bunch of shit on credit and then they blow it up <laughs> like there's a lot you see more of the glamorization and the kind of glee of the sadism that our culture loves horror movies violence people getting whacked i mean this is just we just love this stuff it's it's just it's fun to watch for some goddamn reason i don't know it's because it's a part of us we're murderers we're cold-blooded too that's nature i guess but it's it's sort of now what we're supposed to have moved beyond that one of the things that's interesting about these these shows is it's so much about respect and their egos getting slighted. Oh, this guy didn't pay me the – so we got to fucking kill him, right? Like Goodfellas. You still shine shoes, Tommy, or like, <laughs> you know, Billy Bats? Go get your fucking – you know, I don't know if – you've been away a long time. I don't know if nobody went up there and told you, but, uh, you know, I don't, I don't shine shoes no more. <laughs> So what is he doing? He's reducing him. He knew – oh, Tom, Tommy, he's trying to pretend like he's some fucking big, you know, made man. He's, you know, he's some big shot, tough guy. I I remember when you were fucking humiliated, having to shine somebody's shoes, right? There may be a little bit of a racial – insult in that too right i mean typically it's a demeaning position so what is he, he has to kill the guy he explodes i mean in the sopranos it's a little bit more orderly there's these kind of structures to the families and you see that and there's all these relationships and it's like this guy didn't pay me the proper respect or 
fucking, uh, <laughs> you know, Ralphie insults Johnny Sack's wife. He says fucking, oh, speaking of 90 pounds, <laughs> I just heard, uh, you know, so he insults, he fat shames her. He insults her weight. So Johnny Sack wants him killed. What, what I thought was interesting about that is how relatable it is. Because I think with social media, <laughs> in particular, I don't know. It's like there's constantly this feeling that like, oh, I'm not getting my proper respect. People don't, you know. Look what they did. They didn't invite me to this thing. They invited this other guy or. I'm not, I'm not getting my due. I'm not getting there's like a decorum a whole formality to it that's that's like the mechanics of that world right there's a lot of reasons why it's compelling material certainly i also did want to talk about um it well it's also about families right so it's relatable on that level. The loyalty they they have to each other. Loyalty is such a huge part of it. You never rat. What are the two? You just learned the two greatest things in life. Never rat on your friends. Always keep your mouth shut. They thought Henry wasn't going to rat because he didn't do it in the beginning. But they all turned in the 80s because the, the RICO laws were just too much. Uh... <laughs> So it's something that's like a spectacle and like a larger than life thing. And an adventure, they're living in this like secret society almost like fucking, you know, children. The ceremony, the Omerta ceremony where they like prick your finger and burn a saint card in your hand. Like wow, what a – that's like something children like we're going to initiate. But it's ritual and it's, it's almost like Halloween or something. Well, that's what they said. This one guy – got made Tom, Michael Michael uh, Francis he got made on Halloween night 1975 <laughs> with a bunch of other guys it's like that well it's also like a gender performance right like I think that's one reason why people because it's just this macho I think it got, probably got more theatrical after The Godfather and after movies kind of. That's one thing Michael Francis says. The guys started to dress different. They started to talk different after The Godfather because they were kind of patterning themselves after that. The Corleone kind of like style, you know, slow and waxing poetic, right? He sleeps with the fishes. They're very – the way that they describe things, the way that they name things is very like poetic. Many moons ago, <laughs> leave the gun, take the cannoli. I mean we made it an offer he couldn't refuse. You know, memorable fucking turns of phrase. Maybe it's like one of those Grand Theft Auto things, like you live vicariously. Something everybody wishes they could do. I wish I could fucking whack this guy. <laughs> he fucking insulted me. I'm gonna fucking whack this guy. Go get your fucking shine box. <laughs> we just take it. We just get dumped on our whole lives. I also wanted to talk about um, – so I saw this – I started to talk about this. Shoe head or whatever, shoe on head. I don't delve that much into right into YouTube world, but I, I don't know. Like I said, I was watching these Michael Francis videos. He's a YouTuber. He was on Tyson's podcast, Hot Boxing. Tyson is amazing because, I mean, the guy that they got on the show that like co-hosts with him – is not good <laughs> he's like a jason momoa just like he's like bigger than tyson i think that's why they got him probably because he's like 
not afraid maybe but he doesn't add a lot really he's kind of slow tyson says amazing shit i wonder if tyson has a poetry book <laughs> he absolutely should have a poetry book i would love to do a poetry reading with mike tyson because he said some pretty amazing shit he you know almost like and i think this is almost what i aspire to as a writer and as a human being it's almost like when little kids you know they don't know the like the cliche adult way to describe something so they come up with the most amazing like tyson said um god i wrote it down Shame exalts us to success. <laughs> Shame exalts us to success. I thought that was kind of amazing. Um, so I don't know. You right? We know YouTube is like the fucking the spot now. Everybody, it's 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 a it's a it's a gold rush. If you can, if you can, if you can get viewers somehow i don't know but so anyway i was watching i found this shoe on head for something on twitter so i was like okay i'll check these out and sh she's an e-girl right <laughs> your girls are ruining my life which is such a weird subgenre. i mean part of the problem is like every the only thing people on the fucking internet give a fuck about are like video games so like twitch streaming so like if you're an e-girl you're like a hot girl that's like streaming video games and shit uh, you know, South Park kind of humor. Like, there's just an abnormal amount of people on the internet that, like, this is their life. They're, like, they play fucking Xbox. And being a geriatric millennial and somebody who came up sort of more in an analog time, I do feel like... What does that smell? Um, I, I'm trying to watch these YouTubers because their sense of like what works with a video and shit is it's way just more like hyperactive ADHD PewDiePie like if you're not part PewDiePie I don't I don't know like so for instance my own personal aesthetic is more I don't know I want to be more natural I want to be more like a Jonas Mikas movie that's where I'm coming from I don't know if that's analog world or like it's a slower thing it's less stimulation it's less cutting it's less you know they're always putting background music in that's like funny and I think that 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 kind of shit so okay so shoe on head 1.6 million subscribers and like i was i was seeing it, i was like oh my god these these topics look really interesting on these videos like this is everything that i've been sort of thinking about and talking about and like um what was uh there were a few made over the past year that were like all about the hellscape gazing into the abyss and so she's kind of like a comedian basically it's almost like a daily show thing but she's smart she's very smart and like a lot of the youtubers they're kind of picking apart um modern ethics or morals or whatever in a in a in a slightly more current or less hegemonic point of view like she's not you wouldn't really be able to pin her into like a corner as far as like being a super liberal or super repul you know like she says a lot of things that are liberal you would think but then i think there's an episode where she goes like to the gun range with like this trump youtuber or something so it's like it's not it's not totally kowtowing to like I don't know whatever the fucking you know we've been taught our whole lives to think that in what we're one of two things we're liberals or we're republicans we're 
and and whatever the fuck we're supposed to be like everything that that is right and so now there's just like a total shakeup and it's it's harder to pin people down really and I think in a certain way the points of view get more specific. Like I said, with with shoe on head, <laughs> you're not really like, okay, this person's like a total Bernie identity politics person per se. Like there was one episode where she was talking about um, the new – LGBTQ flag and it had like rainbow and then it had like brown and black stripes and then it had like a trans flag and it was like I don't know why she was uh, part of her show is just kind of like nitpicking like all of this shit that's like in her like news feed I mean it's always from reputable sources it's always like new US news reports or whatever the fuck that is or like uh usa today or you know it's it's never like some kind of totally wing nut shit like she's smart she's not just like totally spouting off some kind of baseless fucking conspiracy theories or something she's she's picking apart like like the theme of this video is it's like we're living in hell and so it's like here's all of the shit that she saw in the news that like indicates that our world is just like going nuts um and a lot of it is just like stuff I hadn't even heard about and didn't seem really that consequential, right? Like it, the show felt like you were watching somebody tell you like the internet websites they went to or some. It's just like here's a bunch of shit I saw on the internet basically was what it was, which like – like I f- shy away from that. I mean I don't want to be that – swallowed up by the fucking internet and have everything i do be i mean i suppose we all are and maybe some people are just better at making something useful out of it and like something good out of it like why should i act like i don't spend five hours a day on twitter or something which is probably you know probably not that far off maybe i probably spend two or three hours a day on twitter maybe like (laughs) because it's the news to me it's a curated uh i made a uh a comic when i was like in seventh grade i think seventh or eighth grade and it was like i think i had an entertainment weekly and i like cut a picture of it out of the entertainment weekly which was like a guy at his in his cubicle like looking at a computer or something in the comic it was like a one frame thing and the joke of it was and this was 1997 or 1998 so this was pretty early on in the development of the internet or at least the mass kind of like having the internet and uh the joke of it was he was showing his kid hey sonny you know let me show you this website i used to visit when i was a kid the joke of it being (laughs) i didn't say it was funny or good but the joke of it being that like the virtual environment has replaced the physical environment at that time it seemed like an absurd kind of like haha won't this be crazy you know it felt like i was like predicting the future because it was like well i was thinking about it like well i spend what do i do with my time like i'm on the internet a lot so when i'm like reminiscing with my kids what am it's not going to be like oh here's the fucking ice cream stand or here's a baseball field or here's the here's the house i used to live in i'll be like oh yeah i remember i used to go to bolt.com or I remember, and it's kind of like that. We used to be on AIM. Remember AIM? It's, it's, you know, it's 20 years later. So it has kind of become that. It has, well, the idea that you can talk about something that seems as bullshit and like flat and meaningless and waste of time as the internet, as like 
something that is a memory or or substantial as a real experience to me i was making fun of that whereas now what i'm noticing right with all these e-girls that are twitch streamers people watching video games or like i said this girl she's literally just telling you about the fucking website she's just it's just shit she saw on the internet basically and all of the jokes are based on shit she saw on the internet and how it's stupid or you know indicative that we're fucked or whatever and so it's produced right like like a one thing the the shot itself is not super great i mean there's like a little bit of like a neon light and like some stuffed animals and some shit so there's there's a little bit of like a lot of things with tiktok and instagram like people are using their shitty looking houses and like bad lighting as sort of a setup for their content their tiktok videos or whatever and so we've kind of become accustomed to seeing like just domestic kind of banality (laughs) on on and it's amazing how many people's home environments are just ugly not that it's their fault but just the way they're built and the lighting and everything or like the fucking countertop or whatever like the walls they're just shitty they're so like prefab and just inhuman uh but so like these e-girls like there's like that but there's a little bit of like they make it like a manic picky dream 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 girl kind of uh manic pixie dream girl kind of uh michelle gondry set or you know like they'll put i don't know they'll put up their fucking stuffed animals or a light or something right um well part of the reason why i'm watching these videos is because i'm thinking well what am i how how does this person have 1.6 million viewers and i literally have zero views like and just what does it look like what is what is this person's perspective what are they smart are they are they better than mass media or that why are people watching this like i mean obviously part of it is because she's like just like a conventionally perky kind of attractive girl in the way that e-girls (laughs) quote-unquote and i'm using that term because i saw it in a song right i saw it and i talked about it the other day the song e-girls are ruining my life (laughs) i didn't know this was a real thing but it you know they have a lot of power and i think they're doing a lot of good like her she (laughs) she's very smart and her her point of view is very nuanced uh like I also think it's like once again it's a packaged instant gratification thing where like every step of the way there's like it's very edited it's well to be honest it's not that different than what I'm doing I don't know how much of it is written but like her her thought process I think is very similar to mine in certain ways and well she's a performer definitely like she's very like animated and she's got kind of um an ingratiating persona i think to like maybe male audience online i don't know i'm not sure what her demographic split is but she's like feminine right she's kind of like post anime i think she's born in 1990 or something she's a little younger than me so right so technically she's doing things that are a little more like current than me i'm uh, even that five years difference of being in the 80s (laughs) like i think my aesthetic is like slower i'm trying to make slow minimalist micro cinema right not necessarily i'm trying to make zines essentially diy lo-fi handmade no that's not i mean her pieces are their s- television style production to some of it there's there's really impressive graphics i'm not sure if she does that but there are these little animated sequences that are funny and smart as fuck to be honest like i would say if like you're looking for satire and somebody that's like a just a really sharp social commentator that isn't i mean 
it's kind of interesting because they are a little less compromised by like show business and being on TV and all of that. I don't know what it is, but like like if this girl was on the Daily Show or something, it probably would change. Whereas to have it be a production like in her house or wherever and just like you can tell probably not that many people work on it and it's entirely probably her thing like it is a little bit purer and maybe more powerful i'd say i would say that her writing is as good as any of the fucking comedy shit out there and in fact a lot of it was smarter maybe some of it i don't know but like just like very sharp show business there's an element of like hipness i think that uh, you know, if you're an e-girl, I don't know. There's there's like a little bit, not of amateur, but there's like there's, it's almost like she's wearing a costume or something, and like I think the personal intimacy of it maybe plays into it. The fact that there isn't an audience, in a live audience anyway, and like you're interacting through comments and uh. That's different than like somebody who's been a stand-up comic or something. Like I guess maybe that's what I'm describing. Even though she's basically a stand-up comic. I mean like she's – did she use the word satire? Maybe she did. I forget. But like basically it, it wasn't – it wasn't too far in that direction to the point where it was just like this person's just trying to make jokes in kind of an annoying way. Like it was more about the sharpness of the observation and the social commentary. That's why I liked it, I would say. I don't know. I mean the things that you have to do to gear your videos more toward a YouTube audience I just find kind of annoying even though that's what the audience needs they need like like her video right it's set up not that different than this to be honest it's like she's sitting in front of her fucking computer and uh she looks nice you know like she's got makeup on she's dressed up and stuff (laughs) from a male gaze point of view which i think probably is a lot of her audience right i don't know that is one way to get a foothold like if you're conventionally attractive to male gaze or whatever toxic masculinity like guys will probably watch you just for that and then if you got something to say you know you could really you could really compound that you know i'm not saying that's why she's successful like her videos they're youtube videos right they're not trying to be a tv show they're not trying to be like they're they're not that different than like a review video or a, um, you know like those Steve Rogan buck videos they've got like funny dramatic music shit we've seen in movies that's like super cliche kind of underlying a lot of it so I don't know if it's scripted or I, I, I imagine it's a lot of it is kind of scripted and then she can kind of riff because she's comfortable right and um so it's uh, as far as i can tell she doesn't put out that many videos it looked like there were only a four or so in the past year or something but they all had like a million views or something you know and so you could tell they were they were it's kind of interesting because it didn't look like they were they looked like it was all shot kind of in one thing but you know like with what i'm doing there's way more of the kind of like rough sketch work of the you know and bud and like and the kind of rough edges of that her video was way more concise it it does that thing where it kind of edits between the gaps so it, there's a lot of jump cutting but it's like very much part of just like the the dialogue or whatever the monologue um but it's it's more concise it's more built up everything has got impact everything's got even though like i said a lot of the stuff she was talking about was just kind of like like why even give this credence this is just some kind of dumb internet story like 
with with what I'm doing, <laughs> I I want to deal with firsthand material, kind of primarily. I mean, I talk about obviously the bigger picture, and I would like to have better news sources and more in depth. Thought, thinking about it from different places so maybe I do need to work harder I mean basically all I check is the New York Times and Drudge Report and I, I don't even really read the stories I just look at the headlines right so YouTube is a good way to hear not hegemonic takes on things more idiosyncratic more kind of individualized takes even if they're most of youtube is just right-wing psychos and i don't really know why they give those people fucking the time of day but um so when i'm talking about my life things i see on the street i mean people i talk to people i've met their own personal experience uh that's more empirical right to me that informs the way that i see the truth of how our world and where the corruption is and where the evil is being done <laughs> when i you know when i see people in new york what i see on the street walking around what i overhear people saying businesses coming in businesses leaving why what what what's causing who's got the money who doesn't have the money why why are all these buildings going up why are all these buildings coming down why do they want to get rid of east river park why are they doing all this rezoning in soho and noho and little italy or Uh, I was surprised to see how much – well, okay. So one of the things that struck me – I'm kind of strolling through videos and I saw a video that Shoe, Head, Shoe on Head had made <laughs> I think a year ago about height, right, and men and height bullshit, right? <laughs> and so I'm thinking, oh my god, you know, like this is one of my <laughs> – my passionate cause is one of my crusades. I'm just kidding. It's a joke. It's a fucking joke because our life is a joke. And this is, uh, but it, I do think it's it's part of the dialogue. It's part of and her video was sympathetic to the point of view that like you shouldn't just make fun of men, you know, for being less than whatever five ten or something, you know. But. The point of her video was is it is it height shaming for women to not want to date men less than six feet tall? And her conclusion was no, that's their preference, right? In the same way that for a man, if it's his preference to date women with whatever, big boobs or whatever, that's their preference. And I get what she's saying. Like certainly, you know, that what we've the predominant strain of the narrative right is that it's the woman's choice right it's their right i'm not disagreeing with that certainly what i'm saying right and this was something she didn't really address in the video right so i don't really think she was she she had she 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 mentioned a lot of good points <laughs> And I don't disagree with her, right? What I'm saying is there's a reevaluation that's happening with our society where we're saying, hey, all of these different body types can be sexy, right? Not just thin women. Because I would I, – once again, it, I would say it's equivalent roughly to – height for men is, is equivalent to men want thin women. Women want tall men. It's just – but, right, we're having this conversation that, like, we're reassessing different body types can be sexy, right? In fucking Victoria's Secret, they're having, you know, plus size models and things, right? This is, this is a part of the conversation. 
and we're reevaluating. We're saying, hey, you know, maybe it's not just thin. I know that I am personally. I know that I'm looking at women. I'm saying, you know, like I probably I think I have been brainwashed because it is a cultural difference that I've noticed specifically with Americans is they want like anorexically thin women. And that's that is like a that is like a brainwashing I think because of uh, not to generalize but when I worked in restaurants the guys that were not from America were attracted to a different body type. They didn't really like thin women. They thought nah. They wanted and not to not to generalize or anything, but I'm saying there is I in my own personal whatever life I'm definitely going hey <laughs> I need to totally rethink my idea of who I'm attracted to, and I'm willing to do that and not be – but I also think that it would be smart and be in their own best interest, right? Like, okay – Because, like, purely evaluating somebody just on one physical attribute as the prime fucking thing, <laughs> it's just not smart. There's a lot more to a person than that. There's a lot more beauty, right? The things that we're taught we're beautiful we're, we're, we're all trained to see beauty that's a media thing in a lot of ways and so we're rethinking this <laughs> so my point being that it should be a part of the conversation right I don't I don't really want to go into this specific issue a lot because I've talked about it a lot and it's just it's I don't this video is not meant to be like a, a point by point like I want to go I want to beat this to death. It's more to talk about um you know I I was a I did like relate to shoe on head and admire what they were doing um. Because they're very smart, they're very astute. Like, okay, you know what? What the stuff I typically would watch, let's say, ten years ago. What there wasn't, there wasn't a big market. There was fucking The Daily Show, right? Colbert, Bill Maher. There wasn't like podcasts and and this and that and like. But now it's like Bill Maher. Do I really want to fucking listen to what this guy has to say? Like. If I can listen to somebody on the internet who's just as smart and or or smarter and has some funny shit to say, like Bill Maher is just so sh sticky. <laughs> He's so jokey. He's such a comedian. It's just annoying. Whereas this shoe on head was predominantly like an analyst, right? And then there was jokes and it was just funny. But it wasn't show busy. It wasn't like this big kind of comedian thing. So I like that. And so I'm just trying to learn like, well, what could I do? <laughs> well, I don't know. I mean, I'm at, I'm at the precipice of a great crossroads where it's like, do I need to – should I – should I work harder on less videos? This is something that Bo Burnham said <laughs> the other day. I was watching <clears throat> some shit with him. Once again, he's a smart person. I think hearing his point of view is worthwhile. I mean, do I think he's like the greatest? Do I think either of these people are like some kind of super geniuses or something? No, but like part of the internet is just – you listening to all voices and choosing the ones that like have smart shit to say. <clears throat> 
I think that's what we're all looking for, podcasts and whatnot. But Bo Burnham was saying, and I hated this, and it's just this phrase. I really think it's not great, but uh, <laughs> he said he would rather work harder on less things and make sure that they're really good than have an IV drip of mon- mundane content, I think is what he said. Mediocre content. He then have an IV drip of mediocre content. Which I thought was a perfect description <laughs> for what I've got going on. Not, I don't think my content is mediocre at all. As, but uh, you know, it's and it. But in a, as a joke, sure. And I'm not like Bo Burnham, where he puts out. But his special, I haven't seen it yet, but I've heard a lot about it. And there's, I mean, Bo Burnham once again is sort of like fully realized version of me he's six foot five (laughs) he was famous when he was like 17 and shit um it's not i can't really do that i've never been good at um working on one thing and like waiting and making it that just doesn't work for me I try – like putting out stuff that's small on a regular basis. That's what poetry is, right? It's one reason why I did it because like you can write three fucking lines. That's a poem. Like movies, it wasn't like that when I was growing up. You need a two-hour script or an hour-and-a-half script or whatever. You need to write a pilot episode. Like now it's a little bit different because you can have TikTok. You can have – webisodes you can have whatever so there's the thinking is a little bit different but um you know partially i just want the audience to come to me (laughs) it's the way that's why my heroes uh always phrased it bob right he didn't really he never really tried to do things to get audience necessarily um but you know i i find what i'm doing not that dissimilar in a certain way than shoe on head (laughs) um like i said shoe on head i think put out four videos in the last year but they're basically the same thing where She's talking about things that she's read. She's it's not I don't think it's stream of consciousness. It might be maybe it is just like a riff and they really edit it. She probably kind of knows what she's going to say. She knows like her take on what the dumb news story is. But it's like it's very clean. It's like here's the graphic with the fucking thing so you see it. And the editing is like moves everything along. I mean my shit – I don't even put this into an editing program. I literally film it and upload it. So I'm not – I'm not even sure if this is possible to be listened to by anybody else and have it make any sense. At this point, I've more or less just like <laughs> – allowed it to become me uh my diary for more or less literally as opposed to you know i was i don't really want to make it like a show to be honest like i i i i like real life real life is the show i think that's fine um and i don't i also don't want to like play to the internet poison shit where it's like oh if i put out some videos about aliens or i mean i talk about that stuff because i see it but i'm skeptical (laughs) i'm sort of like an oppositionist to the opposition of the opposition or something i don't know like i'm a reactionary to the reactionary to the reactionary you know Can you hear the seagulls?
Eagles over Chelsea Square. So I don't know if I if I <clears throat> once again as always it's an economic thing. Uh, you need money to have production value. And for instance, uh, <clears throat> I want to get a GoPro to do – because I've got this scooter now. And I want to talk about the scooter. Maybe I'll talk about the scooter now because that's basically what I've been doing for the past week. But like I think it would really improve my videos. It would add a lot to the videos because I'm, I'm scooting around and I can't film anything because I need both hands on – you know, I need the throttle and the brake. And you need to balance it. These scooters, like they are, you kind of need both hands on it to balance it. And uh, so I can't film anything. But I've been riding around, seeing incredible shit. And it's it's a it's a it's a different way to observe because <clears throat> you see everything faster. You see more of the town. I cover way more of the surface. I see all the buildings. I see all the blocks. I'm not just dipping into a train and, and surfacing somewhere else. I get to roll through all of Central Park. I get to go to neighborhoods I never got to spend time in before, the Upper East Side, the Upper West Side. I, you know, go up Henry Hudson Parkway. It's just so beautiful. I mean, I cannot, <laughs> I cannot overstate how much it has added to my life it's incredible it's in fucking incredible it's just like pure fun pure but it costs 300 bucks right so i never would have done that for myself if i wouldn't have been getting you know and this is just a mental block i have so this is probably one reason why i can't advance in the next level because i'm afraid to invest so like driving around manhattan if i had a fucking gopro on my helmet Suddenly I'd have – I could have moving shots, moving dolly shots. I could film, like I said, more – it's just very dynamic. The vehicle moving through the city, I could live stream that honestly. That's basically what Action Kid does. But I think a scooter, it's almost better because you see more. The flow is better. This thing, you know, it goes 15 miles per hour. It's perfect. It's not too much. It's not too slow. You get places fast, you know, like it's just like vroom. You're like levitating. You're just conveying everywhere. It's beautiful. It is a beautiful way to travel. I wonder what it would be like if Walt Whitman had this fucking thing. <laughs> you know. You can really take in the whole city in a way that it's rapid. I don't know if you could – I mean it's like a bike. It's I, I, A bike, I guess you're going about the same speed. But the bike, you got to work. You know, I mean this thing, <laughs> you just stand there and just – what I want to do is I want to get a headset microphone <laughs> so I can talk while I'm driving around. <laughs> like we've, we've talked – like in Blues Brothers, right? They have the big – fucking megaphone on the top of their car the big speaker so he's walking you know they're driving around with the cb so i want to be able to just monologue while i'm driving around from like the pedestal the lectern you know the podium <laughs> of my uh scooter because i'll have lines occur to me as i'm Writing, that's one of the things that's incredible about it. It's its almost like a form of reading because you see all this text so much faster. You see all the restaurant names, all the business names, all the billboards. All this text is just flying at you. So it's almost like a reading experience in a way. It's like a collage of just different non sequitur you know, slogans and whatnot. And uh, so I want to have just like a headset, so handless, <laughs> as I'm going through Times Square or whatever, and I can just, if I think of a line of poetry, I can just yell it out. 
and that'll be sort of like my i can do a reading i could do a reading (laughs) on the fucking scooter as i'm scooting around like my my friend Thompson, he had the biking podcast. He recorded a po- podcast while he was riding his bike through Brooklyn. I could do that on the fucking scooter, you know. And it, I don't know. I need to be able to film stuff on it because it, it would open up my show visually in a way that uh, I think would inject. So we're, I need to get a GoPro. How much is that going to cost? 300 bucks I'm not spending 300 bucks on a GoPro I don't really want a GoPro the only reason I want it is to do this specific thing I thought about trying to tape my old iPhone to the uh, handlebars (laughs) and just using that so maybe I'll do that initially that'll be like like evil dead uh, dolly (laughs) but I kind of need a GoPro to just strap on my helmet because I could do live streaming as I'm scooting around, film the whole thing, upload it. That's something that like maybe people would watch. (laughs) And if I put an interesting kind of thought pattern over it, that could be good too. You know, I want to – I don't want to do a podcast, but like I'm thinking about like, okay, like these interviews, right, with with poets that I want to do. Like, is it really necessary to do it on film? Like, yes and no. Filming people with my phone in person, it's hard to do it without making every – everybody just feels like it's so threatening. I don't get it because everybody wants to be on Instagram. Everybody wants to be tagged and shit and like – to have views everybody wants views right everybody wants followers but like if you start filming them they're like whoa what the fuck are you doing (laughs) i'm not i'm not trying to like justify like you want it to be comfortable and you want it to be consensual um but okay setting up an interview with a person with the formality of that you wouldn't necessarily have that hurdle per se but i mean even even that where you're like oh we're setting up cameras with tripods i don't want to stunt anybody's natural genius right their spontaneity and like just when a lot of times when you're just having a conversation with somebody and you're not aware that you know or you're not recording it you can really just like go for it and then a lot of times when you people when you start filming them oh they get self-conscious or oh you know like they kind of they kind of scrunch up and it's like how do you uh i want both you know i want it to feel like it's real life but like this for instance this could be I don't necessarily know that this would work as a podcast because just I just don't think – but does it need to be visual? I don't know. Two, two hours of this same fucking shot. Speaking of which, maybe I'll change the angle. It's not very dynamic visually necessarily. Although a lot of these podcasts, there's not that, you know, Joe Rogan, there's a couple cameras. The studio's not that, I mean, this looks just as good, really. (laughs) Not this shot per se, but like this interior. Uh,. Like there is – there's a hunger and a taste for long-form thinking, conversation. Like there's huge audiences for this stuff. But – and this was a lame-ass fucking joke. I saw BJ Novak the other day on Twitter 
said something about why is it that the only way you can get two men together to have a heart to heart is to put a microphone in front of them and call it a podcast and I don't know what the fucking (laughs) I don't personally know anybody I don't think that even has a podcast but it's like there's always these jokes online about like oh this is what guys do they start podcasts and how lame and cliche these fucking guys are starting a podcast and it's like I don't know anybody that started a fucking podcast personally. I mean, I realize how maybe ironic or contradictory that sounds. <laughs> Me sitting on, you know, 100 hours of fucking video of the, over the last year on YouTube of me just mansplaining everything. Uh But are there like a shitload of just like not good podcasts out there? I don't know. Um, I don't listen to Chapo or anything. I mean, most of the podcasts that I've listened to that are like supposedly like some kind of incredible, like WTF with fucking Marin, like, I don't see what's so great about it personally. It's, it's just them having a conversation. Like, I think it's just a fame thing. People are obsessed with fame. He got famous guests. It was that simple. Like, fucking, he had Obama on and shit. Like, um, I think with men, it's like a lot of these guys are just listening to these kind of boneheaded fucking sources that are just reinforcing or or kind of articulating their confusion or articulating a gender role or just a role for them that they can understand. Like they're making – like Joe Rogan is kind of making sense of the bullshit from kind of male athlete – point of view like he's like a wrestler right he's like a fucking weightlifter he's MMA he's so he's uh there's always like this they they can't let down that like macho thing like it's integral to his popularity I think that he's like a a muscular not like macho per se but like fighting and like he's skeptical about certain shit but it's like the wrong shit so I think you know when it comes to vaccine or anything it's like well what does Rogan think what's Rogan's take who'd he talk to is he talked to scientists what's Rogan think about Trump what's Rogan think about Everybody, I mean, is trying to negotiate the new social morals and figure out what the fuck they are. I mean, particularly, particularly, I mean, Trump threw everything into activism in a good way. But I think. people with privilege or people that aren't politically engaged they were just thrown by the whole thing and just thought what the fuck now all of a sudden and so they are looking for voices that are going to like speak to them articulate the new paradigm but but also just kind of flatter their their sensibility and their their choices like rogan it's like you're kind of looking for just like a meathead fucking <laughs> fucking who's the guy joey diaz cocksucker make sense of all of this tell us you know what the fuck is going on should we be woke or are we are we not what the hell even is it 
um, you know, with masculinity, <laughs> and this is something I wanted to mention, there there has been like this sort of reevaluation of male beauty or, or just like what's attractive in a man and what a man – like like Nick Offerman is kind of an example or maybe the epitome of this sort of like, well, he's – He's manly, he's flannel, he's big, he's got facial hair, he's got that mustache, he's like works with fucking wood and shit, he drinks whiskey. I know this because Nick Offerman has talked about this shit in interviews, how he like, oh, I work with like natural wood and I make my own whiskey and bullshit, just a bunch of cliched bullshit, you know. This was sort of out of Bush era going into Obama era. And so, but also it became – maybe just revealed what women were actually attracted to the the image of male beauty and and what was sexy in the 90s per se versus like the 2010s the 2010s it was sort of it was more attractive to be like a big guy with like facial hair right big beards that kind of morphed into a – but also like manicured, super – you know, that kind of like blended with metro culture where it was like there were beards and shit, but they were super like handlebar mustaches or like super clean or like, you know, your head shaved on one side and fucking – it's like a Ryan Gosling meets Mad Men kind of fucking look. But then that became alt-right. Then it was suddenly, oh my god, like – why do all these alt-right guys look like these guys in fucking Mumford or the guy who's a, you know, bartender at the bluegrass fucking place or the craft beer place or just these kind of media – I mean I think partially it's just because Americans are obese, right? We're just like overweight as fuck so like – they had to glorify that some way like guys are just – there's a lot of big dudes. So it's like they're big hairy dudes. That's masculine. That's what a man is. But it, there was like this kind of like – I don't know. Like I said, Nick Offerman was kind of the – it was a joke a little bit but it was people kind of trying to be their dads. It's kind of funny because if you look at Home Improvement, right, Al Borland. Who'd have thought that Al Borland would become like the standard of just like who you wanted to date in 2010s? A lot of girls I knew that were like smart, attractive women, they ended up dating guys that were like big, bearded guys just because like, I don't know, it's like a teddy bear thing. It became a societal thing that we fucking – whereas in the 90s on Tool Time, Al's like a joke. It's like Al's fucking lame. He lives with his mom or whatever. He wears flannel and he's like got all these weird hobbies and shit. And he's like sensitive. All the shit that made Al like lame <laughs> to Tim. Now it's like, oh, Al would be into like Boney Vare and shit. <laughs> Al's like dream hunk for a lot of uh <laughs> Twee. Twee era. Just trying to pick it apart from the masculine side of things. I mean, I think that that's a show that could work. The v- I was thinking about, because I've been watching daytime TV, The View, right? Or now they have a show called The Talk. They're basically the same fucking show, right? Where they just get like a panel of women of various ages and whatever backgrounds. And they just talk about whatever, the the issues yeah megan mccain and Whoopi and but <laughs> remember the best damn sports show period <laughs> that was on fox sports probably it had tom arnold and uh what was that john singletary or i don't remember the guy's name terry bradshaw would be on it sometimes it was kind of like the view but for guys right and of course it's a sports thing right 
But it was like they'd have just like four guys and they'd fucking talk about sports predominantly. But I'm only using that as sort of a funny example. And I wouldn't do this. This doesn't need to be done. But like I think guys are looking for thoughts. (laughs) And ways to make sense of just whatever the fucking landscape is. I don't know. I don't really fall into one trend or the other. Like I'm not like a Beardo, alt-right, South Park guy. And I'm not like a fucking super Gen Z, you know, fluid. I don't, I don't know what my fucking... <laughs> brand right how do you those those things are just like so definitively branded these these patterns come up in society and just like they gain power so more and more people base their identity on them more and more guys grow beards more and more guys get these fucking crazy haircuts and shit more people get tattoos more people get fucking face tattoos right because in the culture it's caught fire so it's like oh, all of a sudden girl a girl likes you just because you have a beard or she likes your tattoos or now all of a sudden big guys are attractive because it's just it's just in the fucking feed right um like shoe on head <laughs> I think has great branding but it's it's like a type like it's e girl it's not it's not that individualized like it's it's that look I mean she's smart and she's got she's not she's not like her whole mission isn't to be like woke right so that's it's not gonna like annoy you if you're if you're not into that, which a lot of people on YouTube like are just fucking dumb, so like maybe they don't I don't know. Well, whatever your fucking niche is, it's like I'm sure there's something for everybody, right? Her fiance is this guy, this armored skeptic, <laughs> who's a tall fuck face with a beard. And his shit is all about like I haven't watched any of it, but it's like about debunking religion shit, I guess. I don't know. I need better visuals. I need better branding material. I need music probably in the background. But I don't know. I don't... (sighs) Mentally, I just have blocks where it's like, oh, I don't want to put the video in my Final Cut timeline because it's too much footage. It's like three gigs. And then it's like two hours of shit. You know how long it would take to edit this? What would I edit out? What would I... I mean I could add some graphics add some music maybe that you know if I had better still frames that would probably help a lot that's something that's like very easy that I could do that might kick my viewership up if I went through and like created compelling still frames for everything that's something that's just like a pragmatic thing that I could do I mean once again if I could get a GoPro that would help a lot Uh, these these you know YouTubers or streamers or whatever a lot of time they have like a rapport with the audience the audience like really knows them and like comments and listens and but it's also it's like anything it's a it's a it's a (laughs) It's hard because it is smart and it is well done, but it's also like a mass. It's not like lowest common denominator, but it's. Does it garner a mass audience because it's good? In a certain way, like my sensibility. I don't know. This is my excuse for everything, but my sensibility. I don't. I don't. 
I don't see a problem with what I'm doing or the way I'm doing it. It feels like fulfilled to me, really. I think if I added a bunch of graphics and fucking music and shit, I don't know. Maybe that would be better. Maybe it would package it better. If I edited all this out, <laughs> is anybody ever going to want to hear this? I probably won't even ever listen to this. It's just me kind of like brainstorming. <laughs> is that exciting to anybody? I Well, is there is there a situation where it would – okay, I've got a million subscribers watching me brainstorm and – I mean, would I have people, hey, I'll help you with your videos. Hey, I'll send you visual shit. Hey, I can edit or hey, we love your thoughts about <laughs> vaccine or this or that or do I have hot takes? <laughs> I feel like I have idiosyncratic takes and I think I try to get like the most correct take. That's my goal. The most fair to everybody. The most like sustainable. I think we're in a in a like situation where just a snowball headed to hell. It's headed downhill to hell or whatever it is. Like a snowball that's rolling headed downhill to hell. So I try to speak my truth. Uh, no one is listening. <laughs> it's making me believe that, okay, maybe I just don't have any real – I don't know how I got the idea that I have power doing this. Uh, but maybe I don't. If I was If I was some better arguer or debater or better at making my points or funnier or stronger – more people would watch. I don't. It's not my. It's not my in, inclination to be like forceful and strong. I'm much more of like a water. I'm like much more like trying to like slide around and and not necessarily be agreeable, but like I don't find confrontation. It's good to get things out in the open, but if you can address things without confrontation, that's better, I think. I don't know. I do like confrontation, maybe. Confrontation is exciting, but <laughs> you need to choose the right confrontations, right? And not just be like addicted to confrontations, which I think can be advantageous to for our world. A lot of type A alpha business CEO types are like into confrontation. I guess like I wouldn't really expect anybody to seriously watch this video per se. It's part of like a larger work. <laughs> I think probably the visual makes it worse maybe. Like it just – like look at my clothes. <laughs> But what I realized today is this is also like practice. I think it's important that I spend the time doing these because it's the best rehearsal for performance, to be honest. If you're doing – like let's say I did this twice a week, two hours. Is that going to be a success on YouTube? Eh. But it's working out. So that way when I go on stage – you know, I can do anything I want during this time. I could play music, I can read, I can go nuts. I need to get more into 
like one of the things that's been hard is I haven't been getting out and doing events and stuff right and I've been kind of taking it easy and slow I could have maybe tried harder to do more events and I haven't performed at all outside with my PA system so I bought that wireless PA like two months ago I haven't even used it yet um so I haven't been like forcing myself out of my comfort zone enough performance is my typical way of doing that and um it's been hard to figure out how to stay and what to work on because like i've been saying this unemployment running out is bearing down that's going to change things a lot and it, It changes the way you try to create because you're thinking, I got to monetize this. I got to turn this into m uh, money. I got to get views. I got maybe that's not a bad thing, but uh, <clears throat> it's also kind of like a a stultifying thing for me. Uh, it's hard for me to like sit down and write plays or or you know tr taking something that seriously where it's like okay i gotta make something good i gotta make i gotta like it's like uh, that just that just kind of like stops the whole process for me so for the past month that's kind of been my struggle it's just like well i don't want to just sit well i don't i didn't want to do this because it felt like it kind of ran out of steam and <clears throat> I just got sick of running to fucking upload the shit all the time and I'm not streaming so it's just like what is the fucking point point? and then I haven't been writing that much because I'm like well <clears throat> I like I want to publish everything I write <laughs> at this point and I just sort of wait for phrases to come to me I don't want to sit down and write a, you know I feel like I've overproduced a lot of the time like I have notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of shit. I'm just like, I can't, I can't even use all this, right? And so I've, it's been just kind of like, well, what have I been doing? I and in the videos too. I haven't. I've been sitting on this one video I shot two weeks ago, and I just haven't been able to nail it down because. <clears throat> I don't know. I partially I was looking at August. It's my reading residency. I've been just trying to purposefully spend more time just reading, which to be honest, I haven't actually even done that much. I've read a little bit more, I'd say. Uh, what the fuck have I been doing? Well, I mean, once I got the scooter, that wasn't that long ago. That was only a week ago though. That's been my main thing for the past week. It's just been riding that around and exploring, right? Seeing more of the city before the weather gets cold. And uh, I, while I'm here, you know, I have this opportunity living here to like explore Manhattan and stuff. So I've seen the West Village a lot. I want to kind of extend my reach while I'm here, you know. And I'd like to stay, but um, so. Like I said, I haven't been able to really film a lot of that stuff. It's been fresh because I could have been taking footage of that the whole time. That would have made a really interesting episode. And I filmed this and that while I'm out, but um, I don't know. I think there has been like I haven't worked out in a long time. You know, I do. I do need something in my life where I'm like like straining <laughs> not a lot but and there is you know like going to the, that's that's the hardest thing i gotta say it's just like i and this is something that i don't know it's never been this hard but just like feeding myself has been so difficult <laughs> going to the store just even going to finding food every day it's just like jesus christ where am i gonna eat again i gotta i gotta I gotta order it online or I gotta talk to a person. 
you know, it's awkward when I go in the deli and I got to tell them what I want. It's like, <laughs> just like Jesus Christ, it's a never ending thing. And that's like 20% of my day is just like finding out what I'm going to eat, cooking. So that's like the strain part. Getting around New York is like kind of a strain in and of itself, but um, I don't know. I've got to make – I've got to figure out in a bigger way just like what is going to happen. Uh, where am I going to be like – well, it's hard to make long-term plans because of my situation here. I mean – it's just not a good position to be in where like I just don't know if – when am I – am I going to be leaving at the end of March next year or the end of next year because that dra- definitely changes. If it's the end of next year, then I have a little breathing room where I can I can just kind of like do my thing and work. That's what I would like, right? Use this place as a studio so by the end of next year, I've really got something going. I'm making money and I can – get into a better thing maybe whereas you know now with the eviction moratorium gone theoretically I could be out of here you know who knows when but even next the end of next March it's like that's not really that doesn't help either because that means I'm going to have to spend this winter like really just like figuring out some kind of my whole life really you know I'm going to have to figure out a job and a place to live because – and what's that going to be? I mean do I want to – do I want to move to Brooklyn and do that again? Do I want to – I don't know. Like (laughs) it's hard to make any fucking plans to be honest. Because who fucking knows about anything? I mean professionally in a certain way, probably my best bet is here because I'm established here. I know people, blah, blah, blah. I can get jobs. But I don't don't know. I mean I don't know if being here has really actually been – I mean it's been good for my development in a lot of ways but I don't know if I can actually do – I need to like open up, right? I need to like be in the sun and and flower and open and in New York, it's just like – it's really hard to do that and I don't even know if – I mean especially now it's just like it's not what people want to see really people don't want to see some white guy like <laughs> saying me 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 right or just being and and I also just want to get back into like crazy performance you know I've been listening the last couple of days has been Lester Young Charlie Parker birthday marathon on uh KCR and so listening to jazz and bebop and stuff it's just like yeah I need to get back into like taking it to the limit one more time (laughs) and uh, I haven't really done I mean that last performance I did at Elizabeth Street Garden so I did three performances this summer KGB New York Poetry Festival, which like, okay, that's great. One a month, not bad for the pandemic, right? But I probably could have pushed it harder. I probably maybe could have figured out some more shit. I mean, they're doing the reading again at Elizabeth Street Garden tomorrow. I probably could have signed up for it again. I'm going to try to do it in two weeks after that. I didn't want to do it back to back. I wanted to give a little bit of... And then me and Time Dinosaur are talking about doing the New England tour. Which I would like to do, honestly. I think the highest vaccination rates in the country are Vermont, Maine. It's all New England. So if there's anywhere it's safe to fucking tour, it'd be there, to be honest. So I've got a little – I got my schedule for this fall. I've got a little window of time between September 20th and like October 18th. So I want to maybe try to go to Vermont 
and do a little tour during that time. <clears throat> Autumn, you know, before it gets cold and shit. It's hard to balance that, right? It's hard to balance, like, how busy do I need to be? Do I really need to, like, be pushing myself with every single day? I mean, particularly if you're freelance or an artist, it's just, like, every single day it's like, okay, what am I going to do today? What – I mean – and I did some shit this week. I made a few books. I, I ordered those books a couple weeks ago. I've been sort of working on video shit a little bit. I've been sort of writing a little bit. I don't know. I did write some scenes the other day. I actually wrote a bunch of scenes, kind of. I'm just like writing dialogue, and it really just sounds like this. <laughs> so part of me is like, I just want to use that. If that's what I'm writing, let's fig- Let's just shoot that. Fuck it. Who cares? We'll figure out what it means later or, or as we're doing it. Like, I don't need to have everything figured out beforehand, you know? I think with film, that's a big mistake. Like art is an intuitive thing. You have to find things. You can't plan it out beforehand, really. Like you have ideas about what you want to do. Like I said, I want to – if I get a GoPro, boom. That's my next episode. That's what it is, me GoProing on the scooter and I'll, I'll add that with something else and boom, there it is. Right now, it feels like if I just keep doing what I'm doing where I'm filming – walking around and stuff it's like i need i need a little more uh i need like characters i need people i need dialogue i need i need new things to see and like a little bit of a of a of a concept of a new concept within the, within the uh, you know all right I mean there's always more to talk about that's good for now I suppose uh, planning I mean I I certainly do I mean are, am I am I actually achieving what I'm talking about <laughs> a lot of the times when I'm talking about what I need to do or what I want to do it's like am I actually getting it done? Like, okay, I am making videos. Yeah, I'm on public access. Yeah, I am I get out in front of people, and sort of, not as much as I'd like. And I haven't done the in-person thing, but I did – I have been scooting around. I went on a date on Thursday. I didn't even talk about that. It went pretty well. I, I had a good time. Uh, I need to go to the beach still. I need to hang out with my friends. I'm, you know, I'm horrible about that. I might, I'm going to try to go to this East River Park meeting tomorrow morning to help out with that. Well, the thing about uh, guys only having a heart-to-heart if you put microphones in front of them and call it a podcast. (laughs) First of all, I don't think that's true. <laughs> but uh, there's some truth to it. There's I mean I've been trying to turn my life into art definitely for the last 7 or 8 years at least. And definitely before that. And to some degree it's like maybe I am a little bit like with the thing where I'm filming at the poetry reading, right? I definitely was was going into it like I need to film this because this is my episode. I'm going, you know. And so in a certain way, I wasn't doing it for that purpose. I'm not like, "Oh, I need to hang out with these people and like talk to them and shit because like I need people to film." But I'm like, "Yeah, this is what I want the content of my show to be about. I want it to be about the lives of the poets. I want it to be about Doing the readings and going out after the readings, basically, right? And and all of that, all of the business of being a poet, right? Meeting, talking about poetry, reading, doing readings, going out at the bar, having beers, bonding, the lives of the poets. Walking around New York, having conversations, 
falling in love, whatever, doing gigs, traveling. So it's like, I, you know, I. This is also something I've been thinking about with friends. It's like, well, if I meet up with friends, then I'll have something to film, right? And I'm not. That's not why I'm meeting up with them. I don't think that's bad. I don't think it's bad that these people are podcasting. I don't think it's bad that like, if there's a performative element to <laughs> the healing or like. The ritual. I don't. I don't necessarily think that's bad. Like, okay, so these guys are having a heart to heart on this fucking podcast. Like, that's just like a condition of fucking what we're in right now. Where it's like there's phones, there's recording devices, everybody's fucking hand. Like, we've been a fame obsessed culture our whole fucking life. Like. You put two and two together, it's like everybody's going to try to get famous. Everybody's going to start recording shit. Everybody's going to start to fucking, you know. I mean a podcast especially is literally just like it's not even written or anything. It's just like we're having a fucking conversation recording it. Uh, that like narcissistic double of, of selfie – and and the online avatar it's just like this is like it's it's a, it's a component of not only who we are it's not only who we are but also just like our professional so filming ourselves taking pictures of ourselves recording ourselves making music it's just like it's all a part of our personal brand and our you know scheme to monetize all right, well, that's uh, frankly fabulous. Uh, thank God I'm me, Jack Lucas. <laughs> Living the Jack Lucas lifestyle. And then I, see, then a graphic would fly up of the Fisher King to kind of explain what the fuck I'm talking about. I, I like that my show doesn't have any graphics because it's meant to be theater of the mind. <laughs> like my dinner with Andre. It's you are supposed to be hip enough to get the references and to see it and to follow it. I've had certain people who watch what I do say it's great. I don't know why I have no views. I need better presentation or something. I don't know. Maybe I should uh, promote some of my posts. (laughs) You got to spend money to make money, you know. Well, that's all. Happy trails. Have a great uh, weekend somewhere in the future. We'll talk soon on the other side of the, uh, the abyss.